This is Orbiting Jupiter by Gary Schmidt. Authors develop themes in many ways, through conflicts and how they're resolved by the end of the story, through the relationships between the characters and how they change over time, through the ways the characters change themselves and how they act, what they think, or what they might say. As we read these last chapters of the book, think about what you believe the themes are. In this video, we're going to read chapters eight and nine together because chapter nine is very short. Chapter eight. Over the next couple of days, Mrs. Stroud had a lot to say to Joseph about violating rules and being mature and understanding boundaries and what was he thinking anyway and didn't he realize and stuff. And over the next couple of days, Mr. Canton had a lot to say to Joseph about missing school and about responsibilities and being truant and meeting expectations, and who did he think he was? And didn't he get it that rules are for everybody and other stuff? We started walking to school again, since Joseph didn't really want to hear the whole lot that Mr. Haskell probably had to say too. My father said that, that was all right. What Joseph did want to hear though, was anything about Jupiter. And the librarian kept her promise. She wrote to Joseph every week, all through the rest of January and into February, the letters came, mostly on Mondays, and sometimes Joseph would read a little bit to us or show the new picture, but mostly he kept them to himself, which my father said was all right too. And you know what? At night now, I wasn't hearing anything from Stone Mountain. It was still dark when we walked to school in the morning, but it was lighter coming home and not as cold. Sometimes we'd have snowball fights by old First Congregational, and Joseph would defend from behind the bridge out sign or sometimes we'd just lob snowballs at the bell. At home, sugaring time would come soon, and already we'd carried the pails and the taps and the tubing down from the barn loft and begun to wash them all up. Joseph and I were splitting wood. He was getting good and piling it beside the sugaring house. And in the small barn, Quintus Sertorius had smelled February, and already he was excited. He knew he'd be dragging the sled through the woods soon, and after a winter of doing not very much, he was ready to get out. Things were changing for Joseph at school. He wasn't doing fifth period office duty anymore since Mr. Delny had nominated him for math Olympiad in April. So fifth period, he was tutoring Joseph in trigonometry. No kidding, trigonometry. In PE, Coach Switek put Joseph in charge of his own squad of kids who wanted to go out for track and field in the spring. Joseph worked them in the field stuff, high jump and broad jump and even pole vault. And he was so good that no one minded that a kid was coaching them except I don't think Mr. Canton liked it. Once he came to class and did a lot of pointing at Joseph, who was showing John Wall and Danny Nations and his earbuds, how Danny Nations and his earbuds, how to pile up the high jump pads. But Coach Switek did something I think the class wasn't supposed to hear and Mr. Canton left pretty quickly. I wondered if Joseph was supposed to hear it though. And Mr. Holloway, or, and Mrs. Holloway in language arts was calling on him a lot. I think because she saw Joseph reading Walden. She asked him if he liked it, and he said he'd already read it once, and he was reading it again. And she asked if he had read her favorite Thoreau book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. And he said, A Week on the what? And she took him to the library, and they checked it out together. You know how teachers are. If they get you to take out a book they love too, they're yours for life. In the third week of February, on Monday, after Joseph finished reading the letter from the librarian that was waiting for him, and it was a good one, you could tell. We went out with my father and tapped 36 trees. These pails will feel, fill pretty quickly, he said. I don't know what we ever did without you, Joseph. He said it just like that, just like that. But after he said it, Joseph looked at him. Think we can put in another two dozen tomorrow, my father said. Someday, Jupiter would love to do this, said Joseph. Now my father looked at him. Yes, she will, he finally said. Really, said Joseph. Let's go back up to the house, said my father. That night, my father and mother went into their room right after supper. They were in there for a long time. I think they might have made a phone call or two. Have I told you about the first time Maddie and I danced, said Joseph. Yes, I said. It was great, he said. I know. It really was, he said. And then he looked down the hall toward my parents' room and went out to be with Rosie, smiling. I'd lost count. The nights stayed cold and the days warmed and the sap flowed like it had never flowed before. And my father almost laughed at the number of pails we brought in and brought in and brought in every day. 
We could hardly wait to come home from school. Joseph said it was almost worth taking the school bus for, but not quite. So we half ran most of the way in the light that slanted against us, and it began to feel as if it had always been like this, like it would always be like this, until the day we came home and there was a new clean white pickup by the barn, running with no one inside and no one around. And Joseph slowed and stopped, and he looked at me, and he said, Jackie, go into the big barn. Why? Just do it, okay? He gave me his books, looked at the pickup again, and went inside. I went to the barn, put our books down on the grain bins, and went to rub Rosie's rump, even though she would have rather had Joseph do it. Waited, rubbed Dahlia's rump. She doesn't care who rubs her rump, she just keeps chewing. Waited, went back out to the grain bins. Then I heard my father holler, no! And then again, no! That was all I needed. Here's what I saw when I slammed into the kitchen less than one second later. My mother standing behind Joseph with her hands on his shoulders, Joseph crying, his face all wet. My father standing in front of the two of them, Joseph's father standing by the back door so close I almost ran into his back. And in his hand, I just saw it for a second, the blue metal of a gun. Then Joseph's father had his arm around my chest and he dragged me against him. And my father took a step towards us and Joseph's father jerked me tight and said, stop. And my father did. I could smell his father, the stink of sweat, the sick sweet of what he'd been drinking. This changes things, he said. No one spoke. This changes things, he said again. He leaned toward my father. It sure does. All I want's my boy. He shook me, same as you. We both want what's best for our boys, said my father. I could tell he was trying to sound calm, but he wasn't. We both want what's best, but this isn't the way to do it. It's my way, said Joseph's father. And then Joseph from somewhere deep in his gut screamed, you sold her, you freaking sold her. I made an arrangement, Joseph's father said. You weren't going to get her and we needed a new truck. I'm not a do good fool like them. He pointed to my parents. Joseph screamed again, not even words this time. He screamed at his father like something had ripped deep inside him. And then suddenly he pulled away from my mother. And if my father hadn't grabbed him, he would have come at us. My father held Joseph from behind, held him as he cried and sobbed, held him as he went to the floor. And then Joseph sobbed into silence. His father said, done now, kid. Joseph looked at him, get in the truck. Joseph stood up. My father held his arm in the truck, his father said again. My father pulled Joseph behind him. You're going to get in your truck, my father said. You're going to let my boy go, and you're going to get in your truck, and this is going to end. But Joseph's father held me even tighter. You think you're in charge here, he said. He held his hand out and showed the gun and then placed it against my side. A cry jolted from my mother. I think that was when I was about to wet my pants. Give me my boy and we'll be gone. My father said, and how far do you think you'll get? 10 miles, 15, maybe all the way to the state border, but they'll be watching for you there. Truck like yours, they'll find you easy. So maybe I'll take both of them, said Joseph's father. How'd you like that? I'll take my kid and yours for insurance. No, said Joseph, no, dad, I'm coming, let's go. He came out from behind my father. Let's go, dad, leave him here. Let's leave them all here and go. His father's arm around me relaxed a little. Joseph came up to us slowly. Let's go, he said, almost whispered. I felt the gun move away from my side. Joseph took my arm and pulled me away from his father. Dad, let's go. He put his hand on my back and nudged me toward my, my father. And Joseph, Joseph took his father's arm. Come on, he said. And they went through the door and outside. Let's go. The door closed. My father ran to the phone, my mother to me. I watched through the window as Joseph and his father got in the pickup. The door slammed and the pickup whipped around and away, not before Joseph looked back one more time and he saw me and then he was gone. They weren't 10 seconds out of the yard before my father had the police on the phone. Here's what we figure happened next. Joseph's father was probably driving a whole lot faster than he could handle. Mr. Canton was driving out of school and he was about to turn right by Old First Congregational when he saw the white pickup coming toward him. He braked and skidded on the ice into the middle of the road. Joseph's father hit him square. 
he jammed Mr. Campton's car over the embankment and into some trees, which kept it from rolling completely. Then he turned in front of Old First Congregational through the bridge out sign onto the Alliance Bridge. They didn't even make it halfway. The rotted timbers collapsed and the pickup fell between the girders. And then it went through the ice and was gone. By the time Mr. Canton got out of his car and ran to the bridge, he couldn't see a thing in the black water. Neither could the police later. No one could see a thing. They didn't get the pickup out of the river for two days. My father wouldn't let me go, but he went. He said Mr. Canton opened the frozen door on Joseph's side, but it was my father who carried Joseph out of the truck. That's all he would tell me. The funeral service for Joseph was three days later. Mr. Dolney was there, Mr. Canton, Mrs. Halloway, Coach Switek, who cried the whole time, my mother and father, the librarian who sat in the back, Pastor Greenleaf from the Baptist Church outside Lewiston, Mrs. Stroud, Ernie Hepner, John Wall, Danny Nations, no earbuds. That was all. We met in a side chapel of New First Congregational because there were so few of us. We didn't sing, but Mrs. Ballou played the organ quietly throughout everything. Reverend Ballou asked if anyone had anything they'd like to say. My father looked at me, but I didn't want to say anything in front of people. I might, you know. So Reverend Ballou read some verses and talked about them. And he said something about angels. And he stopped for a little bit. And then he said, really quiet, where the hell were they? And then we prayed a long time. Afterward, we went out to the cemetery on Lower Gore, where the herd grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents are buried. Mr. Canton and Mr. Dalney and my father and I, we held the ropes that lowered Joseph into our family. <sighs> Sorry. <clears throat> Beside the high white pines. Then Reverend Ballou prayed again, and he said that Joseph had put himself in danger to save others. And then he said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. <laughs> and that's when I started crying, crying like a kindergarten kid in front of everyone, crying because Joseph wasn't just my friend. I had his back and he had mine. That's what greater love is. All right. Ooh, that part gets me every time. All right, if the book ended here, we have a last chapter to go, but if the book ended here, what do you think the theme would be? One of the unique things that I think this author does with the story is that he does put in this last little chapter here. Um, he could have left off the story there, right? And just in this closure, this moment of that Joseph doesn't make it and Jack is left, um, questions about is it better to love someone and care about people and then lose them or just be cold hearted and never love anybody at all. Right. Um, so I think that there's some, some really powerful things happening at the end of the story. And it's interesting to me that he goes on and has an entire last chapter here. So it would be a great piece of analysis to think about why he does that. And then after we read this last chapter together, thinking about why he added this last chapter and what does that do to change maybe, or to make the theme that we thought at this point, <laughs> to make that theme even stronger. So, chapter nine. We waited more than a year, and then on what would have been Joseph's 16th birthday, when the apple trees were blooming and the bees doing their dances, Mrs. Stroud drove into our yard. In the back seat was Jupiter. As soon as the door was opened and Mrs. Stroud got her unstrapped, Jupiter was out and sort of waddling around, looking at everything, touching everything, smelling everything, as if she had a whole lot of time to make up for and she wasn't going to waste a second. Black eyes, black hair, a little less than middle for height, a little less than middle for weight, sort of middle for everything else. She was smiling. Here she is, said Mrs. Stroud. Jupiter stared at my parents, her parents now, too. My father knelt down and Jupiter put out her hand and pulled his nose and laughed. Then my mother knelt down and Jupiter put out her hand 
and stroked her cheek. Jupiter, this is your new brother, said Mrs. Stroud. His name is Jack. I knelt down. Jupiter put out both her hands and pulled my ears. Jackie, said Jupiter. That's right, I said. Jackie. Jackie, Jupiter said again. I stood and I took her hand and we waddled together around the car, then around the yard. We went into the big barn and I showed her the cows. She was a little afraid, but she'd be okay. And then out to the near field where Quintus Sertorius was grazing and looking like he didn't want to do anything else, but he perked his velvet ears when he heard Jupiter squeal. And then we came out to the yard again and Jupiter smiled and laughed and she waddled around my parents and then she stopped and she held up her hands and she said, Jackie. I knelt down and Jupiter got on my back. She closed her little arms around my neck. I stood and hefted her up. She laid her head against me. Jackie, she yawned. Jackie, Jupiter, I whispered back. Jupiter, I promise I'll always know where you are. Jackie, she said again, and I carried her into the house. <laughs>